morning, and welcome to the Closed-End Fund Analyst Roundtable, organized by Christine Advisors and the Closed-EndFundNetwork.com. I am your host, Ken Fincher, from First Trust Advisors. Our guests this morning on the roundtable are Sangeeta Marfadia, Executive Director from UBS, Alex Rice, VP for Closed-End Fund Research for Stiefel Nicholas, John Mayer, Senior Closed-End Fund Analyst, Bank of America Merrill Lynch, and Michael Jabara, Vice President, Head of ETF and Closed-End Fund Research at Morgan State. Uh, Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. This morning's topics will start with a recap of the start of 2012, presented by Alex Rice of Stiefel Nicholas, followed by Sangita Marfadia talking about what to do with municipal closed end funds at this point in time. That will be followed by John Mayer of uh, B of A Merrill Lynch discussion of the continuing capital structure changes, and we'll and with Michael talking about an outlook for the remainder of 2012 in the closed-end fund space. One reminder before we get started is we cannot take questions on individual funds. So if you have a question, uh, please refrain from referring to individual securities and try to maybe take it up to the sector level and so we can answer the question. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Alex to give us uh, an update on what's transpired in the first couple months of 2012. Thanks, Ken. Um, Simply put, uh, the first two months of the year have been very good for many kinds of closed-end funds. Um, the overall markets have performed pretty well. Investors' tolerance for risk has clearly been increasing. And that's benefited each of the three major classifications that we refer to when we talk about closed-end. Um, simply put, those are equity, taxable fixed income, and municipal funds. Um, all three groups are up the first two months of the year. All three groups' share prices have outperformed their respective net asset values, which means, in essence, that their discounts have been shrinking, and thus the closed-end fund share prices have been performing pretty well. Um, compared to the end of 2011, probably the most dramatic change is that of the equity funds. Uh, for the first two months of the year, the average equity closed-end fund was up 12 and 3 quarter percent, which is fairly significant. Um, that's an, in excess of about 3 percent of its NAV move, where the average fund has gained about 9 and a half. Um, among equity funds, probably the most dramatic of the uh, moves of the subsectors of equity are the covered call funds. Um, the covered call funds net asset values for the year are up just a hair under 7%, uh, but their share prices are up over 12 And to me, this highlights one of the important things that we can say about closed-end funds, and that is when momentum for the underlying asset class shifts, when people become more bullish about the underlying assets, oftentimes what we see is that discounts close. And for covered call funds, where their Achilles heel is really, you know, once you've written a call, you're relinquishing some of the upside potential of your portfolio. If you're able to buy a fund like that at a large discount, and then things for the equity market, investor sentiment start to get a lot better, you can see the discounts contract, share prices can actually outperform their own asset values, and that helps replace some of the lost capital gain potential that you give up when you start writing calls. Um, on the taxable fixed income side, uh, I think one of the interesting things that we've seen thus far this year uh, is the resurgence of credit-oriented funds. Um, and of course, of those, the most interesting to me is that of the senior loan funds. Um, senior loan funds are up almost 10% through the first two months of the year on average. Uh, and this is despite Ben Bernanke promising to extend the period of uh, low uh, short-term interest rates to 2014. Uh, since senior loan funds are a floating rate asset class, uh, they're basically a pure play on credit. And so if people's expectations of rising interest rates have actually been more subdued for the first two months of the year than they may have been at the end of 2011, uh, the dramatic performance of that group really shows that investors' tolerance for credit risk has been steadily gaining for the first two months of the year. Um, and with that, the last group, uh, these are the municipal funds. Uh, municipal funds, the vast majority of which do use leverage, uh, have done very well through the first two months of the year. Again, Ben Bernanke's promise to keep rates low has certainly been a boon for investors. Uh, but that being said, their share prices have outperformed the least through the first two months of the year. Um, and so without going too much into the muni funds, because we are going to address it later as a specific topic, um, I'll turn it over. Well, Alex, just one question, though. You, you, you touched upon covered call funds, uh, but one of the things I note in covered call funds is in that sector, you have very big discounts, but you also have very big distribution rates. And while you get that upside, are those distribution rates in, in good standing at this point in time? Well, I think it's important. 
important to note that any equity funds distributions, any ability for an equity fund to pay its investors is going to come from the capital performance of the fund. Uh, if you own individual stocks and are writing calls, or even if you're not, the ability for a fund to consistently meet its distribution obligations are going to be dependent on that fund's ability to make gains over time. And so when the markets are friendly, when the markets are going up the way that they have for the first two months of the year, uh, that means that the distributions are likely going to be more stable than otherwise. But it's a very important distinction to make for investors. If you're investing in equity funds, especially ones with large dividend payouts, those dividends are going to be inherently much less stable than they would be out of a bond fund. Uh, if you're clipping coupons, you have some regularity in the income flow into the fund. If you're not, then it's much more tenuous. Thank you. Now, Sangeeta, Alex touched a little bit upon municipals, and municipals have been very good performers. Now, you have the entire municipal sector probably trading at or near its net asset value. What happens to municipal funds now? Where do you go with municipal funds? So, as Alex said, muni funds have also done well this year. We know market prices are up a little bit more than what the NAV performance has been. And this is clearly on the heels of the strength in the underlying muni market as well. We at uh, UBS Wealth Management cover about 30 national leveraged funds, and most of the numbers I talk about relate to those 30 covered funds. We are looking at average premiums of about 3%. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are some funds that trade at double-digit premiums. If you take that out, as you said, the funds are trading at a slight discount. Compare that to where we are in terms of a 52-week average premiums or discounts. It's pretty much in line with 52-week average for the universe of leveraged muni closed-in funds. In terms of the dividend yields, the funds are paying over 6%. 6.2% taxable free, uh, tax-free income, obviously, is what's driving the investors to buy up these funds. Let's not forget that 2011 was also a very strong year for the muni funds. We've, we've seen several funds being up anywhere from 15 to 20% and we are continuing to see this trend. So it remains to be seen what happens, what do we do from here? I think a couple of points to remember. One, last, last week we did see uh, a lot of the muni funds announced dividends. Two major muni uh, fund managers, BlackRock and Naveen as well. We did see some dividend cuts from Naveen. Most, probably less than what I had expected in terms of cuts, um, dividend cuts. BlackRock, on the other hand, surprised a little bit. We didn't see dividend cuts on the muni funds, but in fact, we did see some small dividend increases. You may ask, why are we seeing dividend cuts at this point when rates continue to be so low? We've heard the Fed say the rates are not going to be going up till 2014. That's mainly because of the change in the types of leverage. And John Mayer will go into this into further detail as to what's going on with the leverage that's resulting in higher borrowing costs and therefore we would think funds would be cutting the dividends. I think the reason we didn't see much in dividend cuts, it could be a few things. The funds do have cushions of undistributed net investment income or which we call uni balances. So it's really depend, it depends on the fund managers. Do they want to use up some of the uni balances or do they want to align the dividends in line with what the earnings are? So. I think the funds are still under earning the dividend. It's a matter of time before they cut the dividends. Two other points I want to make. Um, as we head into first week of March, middle of March, we do typically see seasonal selling in the underlying muni market, partly because people want to sell munis to pay their taxes, and we could see that transfer into the closed-end muni funds as well. And also, we've seen a lot of new muni supply coming to market. I think the 30-day number of visible supply is the highest that we've seen in 2012 for the muni bond. So that could have some negative impact on the muni closed end funds as well. Okay. Now, let's talk a little bit. You touched upon it, the, the concept of the uni balance. And it, it, it seems like it's more focused on a – people talk about uni balances more with municipal funds than they do with any other fund. Give us a little bit of – you know, information in regards to uni balance, why is it important, and sort of what are we seeing right now in uni balances that are those fund shots that actually produce that number? So the uni balance is, is essentially, it's a balance sheet item, it's the difference between what you earn and what you pay out. Given that we've been in such low interest rate environment, the fund companies have been able, able to put some money away as a cushion 
to be used when borrowing rates go up. Obviously, they can't hold back a lot of income because of the RIC rules, regulated investment company rules. There are several funds that do have significant cushions, but they range anywhere from five cents to maybe about 20 cents annualized basis. Depending on what the fund companies are looking at, sometimes we may see these uni balances being used up before you actually see dividend cuts. I think as an analyst, we want to see the fund companies bring down the earnings once they know the fund is not earning the dividend versus using up the uni balance because then you're going to have a much bigger cut. Mm -hmm. And like you said, you typically look at the uni balances and muni funds because on equity funds it becomes a little bit more complicated because you are counting on some of the capital gains, as Alex said, on an equity fund. So the gains may offset some of the uni numbers and they may not really give you the true picture. And there's also the whole issue of timing difference in terms of when the equities pay out dividends, et cetera. Okay, thank you. Now, John, you wanted to talk a little bit about changes in the capital structure of those <coughs> funds. Obviously, that started in 2008, early 2009, and we're still working through it four years later. Give us a little bit of information. As Sangeeta mentioned, cost of leverage is low because the Fed has kept rates low. Sort of where do we see this going in terms of capital structure changes? What inning are we in in terms of that ballgame? Okay. Um, thanks, Ken. Let me just step back in time. Um, uh, first of all, when we talk about capital structures, we're talking about different forms of leverage that uh, closed-in funds use or utilize. Um, now, most closed-in funds are leveraged instruments. Um, they borrow short, invest long. They arbitrage the positive slope of the yield curve to provide a higher yield um, to investors. And that's one of the appeals uh, to a closed-end fund. Um, in February of 2008, um, there was an event that occurred, and that event was that the auction market, uh, auction rate preferred, uh, failed. Um, it, it no longer became an auction-driven market, um, and liquidity was locked up. At that time, there was $65 billion of outstanding auction rate preferred, split between taxable and tax-exempt uh, funds, um, about evenly split, give or take. Um, over the past four years, fund companies have been working through options to provide liquidity to um, auction rate for holder, holders. Now, I'm going to be agnostic in terms of whether I believe that a fund company should or should not have replaced auction rate preferreds. But four years later, uh, there's about $51 billion of outstanding auction rate preferreds. Now, if you split it between tax home and tax exempt, there's about 70% of the muni market uh, has been redeemed in terms of auction rate preferreds, and 87% of the taxable instruments have been redeemed. Now, first, let's talk about taxable. The taxable instruments were a bit easier to solve, and it happened a lot sooner. Um, the first couple years, we saw, first of all, we saw the financial crisis, unfortunately, uh, unfold in September uh, 2008 and early uh, 2009. Um, and what happened was many fund companies had to redeem um, auction rate preferreds. And that, a lot of that occurred on the taxable side. So we saw redemptions of auction rate preferreds, and they were not going to reissue them. Um, and anything that was left, or it was actually some of it was done prior to the financial crisis, we saw uh, redemptions of auction rate preferred with credit lines or bank debt. Um, there was also some internal forms of leverage that uh, fund companies could possibly use, like reverse purchase agreements. Um, the more difficult issue uh, was the muni side. You couldn't put a taxable instrument in a tax exempt fund. So the auction rate preferred instrument really was the only option except for tender option bonds, which was more of an internal form of leverage, splitting apart a single bond um, and putting that into uh, a portfolio and selling a portion of, of, the, uh, of the, um, the trust and the tender option bond to a money market fund. So there had to be a liquidity provider. So that was the kind of the first replacement. We saw some slugs of that happening in probably in 2009, um, perhaps some in 2008 as well. Um, so then the fund companies had to come up with other instruments to replace the auction rate preferreds. And we saw uh, Nuveen come out with a couple, a couple instruments. Uh, the first was municipal term preferreds, MTPs. MTPs um, essentially is termed out preferreds. Um, the, the term was five years. The interest expense was rather high, two and a half to three percent. So what they were doing, they were taking out instruments that had rather low interest rates anywhere from, at the time, um, a quarter to a half percent, and replacing a portion of the leverage in a particular fund with rates anywhere from two and a half to three percent. So that increased the overall cost of leverage. 
when Nuveen did this, they pretty much did it for only a portion so of the leverage in a particular fund. So the blended cost of leverage was still rather low. So that was the first uh, vehicle. Second vehicle, which has um, gained traction both with Nuveen as well as BlackRock, is the variable rate demand preferred, VRDP. VRDP. Um, this is a money market eligible preferred. Um, essentially, the, uh, there, there's a bank or financial institution that becomes the backstop. Um, so if the, if, uh, the, the, the uh, instrument is sold to a money market, um, and if it has to be redeemed um, for, for whatever reason, um, the backstop could take the responsibility. Um, after a certain period of time, um, the backstop can actually put it back to the fund if, the, if a remarketing agent cannot resell the variable rate demand preferred. So you are replacing a permanent source of financing, the auction rate preferred, with something more temporary, a VRDP. Then there's something that's kind of in between, um, the VMTP, uh, the variable municipal term preferred. The VMTP, somewhere between an MTP and a VRDP, it's an institutional product, it's not sold to retail, and it typically has a term of three years. Um, so that's another instrument that's being used by both Nuveen as well as BlackRock. So, four years out, um, we've seen uh, the bulk of the market um, having been redeemed. There's still about, a about $15 billion of outstanding auction rate preferreds that are out there. Um, but net-net, our overall cost of leverage is rising. Because a VRDP and a VMTP, the, the cost is about 100 to 100, 125 basis points. The auction rate preferred is about 25 basis points. So net-net, you are increasing your cost of leverage. But the average cost of auction rate preferred over time has been about 3%. Still, we're still significantly lower than that. Um, but the negative is that in many cases, you have a temporary form of financing. One question that comes to mind right away for me is you have a temporary form of financing where you're really relying on many of the major money center banks. Yeah. Banks aren't don't seem to be getting a lot healthier here over the last couple of years. What happens if the banks get downgraded to these types? I mean, do they start pulling that financing from these closed-end funds? Well, it's, it's really specific to the agreement between um, the fund uh, and, and where they receive their, their uh, backstop, or their, the, the liquidity provider and the agreements that they made. Um, within the documents, um, if a bank is downgraded, um, it really depends on you know which rate agency downgraded and what's written in those documents. Um, so if the documents say that uh, the rating has to be a certain level by one, two, or three rating agencies, um, in certain instances, if a bank is downgraded, um, the money market fund could may have to sell that instrument, the variable rate demand preferred. Um, the backstop may have to take it back. Um, and there could be a, about a six-month period where they have an opportunity to remarket it to another uh, uh, money market fund. If nobody buys it, the bank could actually put it back to the fund. Um, so there is that possibility, yes. And then another question I had is, on all the, you, you started with saying we had $65 billion in auction rate preferreds outstanding when this whole thing started. We're down to about $15 billion. Of that $50 billion that's been redeemed, has most of that been redeemed at par? And is it still being redeemed at par? Um, yes, it has been being redeemed, has been redeemed at par. Okay. So while uh, investors lost liquidity, they didn't lose asset value. Okay. Now Michael, John just gave us a quick uh, intro in terms of the capital structure changes, and we're going to come back to that, I think, <coughs> some more questions after. But give us an outlook from a Morgan Stanley Smith Barney perspective for the remainder of 2000. So what are you seeing in terms of secondary markets, in terms of uh, where you're focusing some efforts, as well as what do you think it looks like in the IPO market for the remainder of this year? Sure. No, great. Thanks, uh, Ken. And just I kind of want to lay it out for you. We generally look at the close on fund market in three distinct areas. And this is sort of the way Alex presented his sort of uh, more backward looking uh, review. We look at it from a municipal standpoint, taxable fixed income, and then equity closed end funds. On the municipal side, we currently have a neutral outlook on the space and are really advising clients to lighten up if they are overweight on muni closed end funds. We don't see a whole lot of upside here, and I think, you know, that being said, 
you know, I do think coupon clipping is a very viable, you know, scenario. Um, and quite frankly, coupon clipping is pretty good considering the yields you're getting. Singita had mentioned, you know, you can get a 6% uh, leverage national pretty easily right now. So, you know, uh, you know that, that's kind of what we're expecting, you know, going forward. On the plus side, as I just mentioned, yields are very attractive, especially compared to individual munis. Um, and the funds do have big uni balances, also like Sangita had mentioned, um, which are essentially like rainy day funds, which can essentially keep the, you know, make the, allow the fund to maintain its distribution when short-term rates do go up. So the positive, you know, people always ask, well, Mike, what's driving positive fundamentals in the muni space? And quite frankly, they're primarily being driven by low borrowing costs. On the negative side, funds are trading richly by historical measures. At the funds that we cover, on average, are trading at a premium of 1%. This compares to an average discount over the past year, the past five years of about 4%. So, you know, clearly by, if you go back now, quite frankly, the past five years have been extremely volatile and a little weird. Um, but nonetheless, you know, the funds are not cheap at this, you know, right now. Um, the other thing that you really need to be careful of with the funds is they do have very long durations. Most of the leveraged products have durations in excess of 10 years. While we're not anticipating rates going up in the near term, what does make me very cautious is everyone really is thrown in the towel on rates. You know, if we go back literally just a year ago, everyone thought rates were going up. Today, no one's talking about that. And quite frankly, you know, that's when we do get blindsided. I'm not quite sure what the catalyst would be, but these funds are very exposed if rates do go up. We do have our select favorites in the space. Generally, those trading cheaper from a valuation standpoint with decent earnings and good sized cash reserves. On the taxable fixed income side, it's a little bit more difficult because you don't have apples to apples comparison like you have on the muni funds. In general, we also have a neutral outlook on this space and, but favor the more credit sensitive portfolios. And they've done pretty well you know, year to date, but we still think you know, there, there are, you know, there, there's some room left. If we do double dip in the US, which we are currently not predicting, our favorite funds are exposed. So just be aware, you know, leveraged credit sensitive portfolios on the taxable fixed income space are not the place to hide if we do double dip. If this occurs, discounts are undoubtedly going to widen and they can widen pretty dramatically. Um, you know, and all you have to do is go back to second half of 2008, early 2009 to see this occur. Fund selection in our view is more important right now in the taxable fixed income space as say compared to muni's. We favor funds that have attractive, sustainable yields and are avoiding those funds trading at good sized premiums. The average taxable fixed income fund, just to put this all in context, is trading essentially at net asset value right now. This compares to a 5% discount over the past five years. So once again, taxable fixed income closed end funds, you know, they are not cheap. Shifting over to the equity side, we have a positive yet conservative view on the equity space. And I know this sounds a little contradictory, but uh, that's kind of the way we're looking at it. In particular, we favor the equity income funds that pay attractive distributions. Despite, despite posting strong returns over the past three months or so, we still find value in certain equity income funds. The average equity closed on fund right now is trading at about a 7 or 8 percent discount. And this is, you know, it's attractive, especially when you compare it to other asset classes in the closed end space. And, you know, when you look at the discounts compared to where they've been the past five years, you know, in line to slightly cheaper from where we've been. Um, you know, I often get the question, well, Mike, why are the equity closed on funds trading as cheaply as they are, especially compared to, say, the munis or taxable fixed income funds? You know, I think it's for a few reasons. Number one, a lot of the investors I speak with are ex extremely skittish about equity markets. They don't have a whole lot of conviction and are really worried about dividend cuts, especially in the equity income space. Uh, in particular, you know, my team, we like the covered call um, and dividend paying equity area. We like those funds with attractive and really sustainable distributions, selling at good size discounts. Uh, people often say, Mike, what can we expect from returns in the equity income side? And I'm just going to mention the cover call you know, fund as an example. I very easily see us, even from here, I mean, they've had a nice run, but we could very easily do 10 plus percent returns for the remainder of this year. You know, if equity markets are up, I think these funds will get some participation, not full participation, but decent participation, and you still can collect nice distributions. 
If funds are, or if, you know, if markets are flat to even slightly down, I still think you can do pretty good numbers because the funds are trading attractive from a discount standpoint. The situation where you really need to be careful of is if equity markets really fall off a cliff. Because what will happen in that scenario is we'll see extreme discount widening. I mean, you can go back and you can see 20 plus percent discounts very easily, especially when you're looking at, at, at areas such as the, the cover call uh, you know, space. The next thing I wanted to discuss, kind of moving on, is sort of the outlook for the 2012 um, closed end fund IPO market. Just to sort of take a step back, closed end fund IPOs are extremely cyclical and tend to sell best when investors have good conviction in the markets. And clearly, we're not there right now. You know, if you could, I'm just going to go back a year ago. In the beginning of 2011, the closed end fund IPO was relatively strong. And I think that kind of moved in conjunction with sort of bullish sentiment in the equity markets as a whole. The second half of the year, you know, once the third quarter hit, we got a lot of volatility in the underlying markets. You know, the IPO market, I don't want to say it really weakened, but it definitely did weaken as volatility returns in the market. Fast forwarding to this year so far, despite strong equity markets, closed on, uh, you know, fund IPO issuance has been relatively weak so far this year. You know, once again, there's a lack of investor conviction, and most investors I do speak with are very concerned and unsure about, you know, where markets are going, whether it be on the equity side or even on the fixed income side. Another point to make is that recent closed end fund IPO performance has not been, you know, all that great. If you look at funds that have come out over the past year, on a market price basis, most are trading below their IPO level. NAV performance has been a little bit better. Uh, but nonetheless, and one thing I find myself always saying is, you don't own the net asset value. You own the market price. So it's something just to keep in mind. Another point that we have been you know, discussing uh, among, amongst our panelists is, you know, it's difficult to find outsized yields in underlying asset classes. You know, let's look at the munis as an, as an example. You would think now would be a great time to bring a muni closed on fund to market, right? Space is trading richly. The problem is you can't find good yields in the underlying muni market. So it becomes very challenging to, drink, you know, to bring products that don't have outsized yields because closed end fund IPOs are still sold based on a yield basis. Um, we've also seen uh, you know, more recently a shift away from equity offerings, uh, more towards fixed income. I think that trend will probably continue here in the near term. Um, you know, and the main reason why we've seen you know, or, or have moved away from you know, equity fund offerings is the equity funds are trading very cheaply in the secondary. Why would you pay a premium at the IP when you buy one at the IPO when you can buy one in the secondary trading at a good size discount? You know, so that sort of leads to the next point. Well, fixed income closed end funds, many of them are trading richly by historical measures. This makes it a lot easier to sell a closed end fund IPO when the secondary is trading richly. So that's why I think you, know, you, you, you have seen or will see going forward you know, more fixed income closed end uh, IPOs. Some additional comments, you know, I can tell you just when I look at sort of what Morgan Stanley Smith Barney is doing on the IPO side, um, you know, I think firms are being a lot more cautious about bringing deals. They'd rather bring one good deal versus say two to three smaller deals. So, you know, they, they, I think they want to focus and, and really narrow themselves and, and have a killer, you know, one, one good size deal. The other thing too, post 2008, I think you know, it's fair to say the brokerage world is a lot more concentrated. And if you don't have the, you know, one of the big powerhouses like MSSB, Merrill, UBS, you know, Wells Fargo, if you don't have them on board as far, as far as from a syndicate standpoint, it's very difficult to get a new deal done. You need one of the big players. And then you know, sort of lastly, this is more of a Morgan Stanley Smith Barney thing. I'm not quite sure about the other firms. But they want to bring deals. Um, out into areas where the firm has a positive view. They don't want to bring a deal out into an area where the firm is really bearish. So that yeah, does sort of limit what you have uh, available from a new, you know, from an IPO standpoint. Thanks, Michael. Now we've had some questions rolled in uh, on the webcast, so I'm just going to read off uh, the first question we got. This is from Jeff, and this is for anybody at the table, maybe everybody. Uh, when you analyze closed end funds, roughly how much? How do you allocate your time between considering those factors that are idiosyncratic to the closing funds, such as discounts, premiums, sustainability of distributions, versus those considerations that can be used to evaluate any portfolio, NAV performance, sharp ratios, etc.? So how much time do you spend on 
if it's at a premium or a discount versus how is the manager done from an NAV perspective in terms of his portfolio? Well, I mean, I, I'll start off on that. Uh, I, I, I'll steal a line from John where he, when, when asked about, you know, what is a closed-end fund? A closed-end fund is a structure. It's not an asset class. Uh, and so to that end, uh, when you're analyzing... That's patented, by the way. That's quite all right, and I'll give you credit every time. Uh, <laughs> When you're analyzing a closed-end fund, looking at the fundamentals of the portfolio, looking at the track record of the manager, although past performance is not indicative of future results, but taking those things into the account when you're analyzing an NAV, operate, you know, I would say that takes up a big chunk of your time. Um, but as a closed-end fund analyst, we are also charged with the task of looking at this from a structural perspective and saying, what are the things about the structure that confer a benefit? What are the things about the structure that add extra risks? So. Um, I think each of us is different in terms of our relationship versus the other segments of our research departments. And so, for instance, at Stiefel Nicholas, I basically operate standalone. Uh, I am charged with figuring out whether an asset class has, you know, if it's broadly dangerous or there's something going on there that we don't like. Um, but I'm not charged with following what the prescribed recommendations out of our strategist department are or anything like that. Um, and so as such, we do a lot of work on the NAVs, but absolutely, look, as a closed-end fund analyst, if you ignore things like discount, if you ignore things like volume, expense ratios, all the things that come into account with closed-end, then you're missing half the story. So maybe I'll make it a little bit simpler. If you were to say you split 100% yeah, of your time, how would you split your time between those things that are idiosyncratic, such as discount, premium to net asset value, on one hand, and NAV manager performance, uh, you know, leverage characteristics on the other hand. What, how would you split that performance? Uh, I mean, it, the, the short answer to the question is 50-50, but to, to sort of refer back to what Michael said before, uh, when you start looking at the taxable side of the equation, there's much less commoditization of funds. Funds are very, very different from one another on the taxable side. On the municipal side, you're going to find a lot more commonality, especially within fund families. So on the muni side, more time goes into the closed-end fund specific factors. On the taxable side, you're probably doing more portfolio work. If, if I could chime in, I think one of the things, yes, you look at the premium discounts, but you also, and this, the more I do this, I'm becoming more aware of it, a fund could be trading at a premium, and it's very easy to say go out and sell. You also have to be aware of what's going to drive that premium. And one of the things investors have to keep in mind, the premiums are as good as until they last, if a fund is trading at a huge premium, you're taking on additional volatility because it's quite likely that that fund could go down 10, 15% over a couple of days very easily. In terms of spending time on it, I think it is an ongoing process. So you kind of always have it behind. When you first pick up a fund, you're looking at those things, but you also have to be aware of everything else. What's going on in the marketplace? What's going on in the underlying sector? So it's not just say, you know, if you look at the premium discounts, most of us wouldn't just necessarily say, go sell this fund, but you want to avoid funds trading at huge premiums. It also depends what the goal of the investor is. I get very often told the client is X, Y, Z years old. They really don't care about the principal. All they want is income. In that case, it doesn't matter if the fund is trading at a premium or not, if they're just trying to maximize income. But then, on the other hand, you do have some value investors where they will stick to their theory of buying a closed-end fund at a discount. As soon as that fund hits a premium level, they will get out of the market. So it, it's a combination of what you want and a combination ongoing process of what you look at. And then you also have to know what comes associated with certain fund companies um, there are some fund companies where you won't see their funds trade at a premium. On the other hand, there may be some which constantly trade at premium, and you have to analyze that further. But I think you touched on something. Do you pay a premium for a star manager? We've seen a couple star managers in the closed-end fund space recently. Uh, do you pay a premium for a star manager? I personally don't because I want to have a stable income, and I do look at what the underlying NAV performance of that fund has been. And if I really am looking at that star manager, chances are that star manager manages an open-end fund. And I could easily go and buy their open-end fund at net asset value versus paying a 40 or 50% premium. Okay, fair. John, any comments on this? Um, you know, I agree with my colleagues on a lot of the things they said. Um, but I think in terms of 
the manager performance and looking at the, the manager becomes a lot more relevant. And it's, it's always relevant, but a lot more relevant when the, when the fund is trading at near its net asset value, right. which is the case with a lot of muni funds. And then you kind of have to delve into um, you know, how that manager performs, um, where they're focused, higher credit, lower credit, what, what's doing better, lower or higher credit quality. Um, and also, I think you, should, you, you have to look at fund families and their dividend policies. And a lot of the dividend policies, policies actually drive the valuation of a particular fund where we see some of the PIMCO funds having higher yields than some other funds. Um, high, higher underlying net asset val value yields, which leads the funds to trade at premium. Because if a fund is generating more income and paying more a higher dividend, generally that fund's going to pay, uh, it's going to trade at a premium. And investors, unfortunately, don't necessarily discern um, the difference. All their, many are just considered with that consider that high distribution rate. And unfortunately, um, they don't look at the quality of that distribution. Right. And what we're charged with doing is looking at the quality of that distribution. Um, is that distribution going to be maintained? And is a sudden drop in that distribution rate going to cause a valuation change? So certainly the underlying manager performance is relevant. Kind of their, their, um, the characteristics of how they manage is very relevant. Um, and that often leads to the valuation of a particular fund. So it's not only the fact that you're looking at the underlying entity performance, you have to actually look at the individual fund firm or individual manager and how they do things differently than that other manager at a different shop may do it. Yeah, certain shops in terms of managing distributions will cut or increase dividends incrementally. Mm -hmm. um, certain fund companies will cut or increase dividends by a large amount um, to cover a year or two year period. Okay. Um, and then you're for, let's use dividend cuts are a lot easier than dividend increases. Um, the person who bought the day before the cut, uh, before a large dividend cut on a particular fund company that tends to cut in large way, in a large way, um, is not that happy. Um, for Because the, the stock price will probably decline by a lot. The fund company that does incre incremental increases or decreases, let's say decreases, um, the value, the, the stock price probably won't go down all that much. Right. So it's more of like an, a weighted average cut versus one. So they're big giving cut. you a chance to get out. Yeah. Exactly. So if you want to make a move because you see that movement lower in the distribution, right? They're giving you a chance to sort of decide what you want to do with that position. Yeah, and it, 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 it's very clear the characteristics of different fund companies. Right. Um, sometimes, as analysts, we think that certain fund companies should learn from their past experience, but they don't necessarily. Michael? Absolutely. And just to kind of tell I mean, everything that was said was spot on in my view. You know, one thing I found myself always saying is just because a fund is trading at a premium doesn't necessarily mean it's, it's expensive and then vice versa. Just because it's trading at a discount doesn't mean it's cheap. You know, we do look at premiums and discounts, but to, to me, I mean, it's more important to see, you know, yield and the stability or sustainability of yield. So we'll, you know, we'll, we'll spend more time looking at how sustainable is that distribution? Is it physically being earned and can they maintain it going forward? So I would say that's where you know more of our sort of emphasis or work goes into. Premiums and discounts are probably a little bit more secondary. Okay. Uh, we had a question that came in before the call and it touches a little bit back on uh, the uni balance, the undistributed net investment income. And the question was at what level, you're seeing a lot of funds either under earning distributions or going to what they call negative uni we can touch on that. At what level do you signal to turn off your buy selection? If you have something that's gone to a neg I mean, would you have something on a, as a buy if it had a negative uni? Or when it goes negative, do you turn that off from a buy to a neutral to a sell? Anybody want to comment on that? I'll take it. I think, and this brings us to one of the questions that you posed, Ken, before we started. Why is it that we saw dividend increases from BlackRock, but we saw cuts from Naveen? And I think this also goes back to the point that John made, different fund companies have different policies. Mm -hmm. If a fund is under earning its dividend, let's say by three cents, and they have a 20 cent cushion, I'm not necessarily gonna tell investors to sell that fund. I think you have to sort of manage their expectations a little bit also. So when you see big over earning of the fund, I'm sorry, under earning, if the fund was under earning by 10 cents, the uni balance was only about 5 cents, that's a clear signal that you ought to get out of the fund, or at least be ready for the dividend cut. 
And one of the reasons why we saw dividend cuts um, from Naveen and not on BlackRock funds, it goes back to the timing of refinancing of the leverage, as John mentioned. So Naveen was, I think, clearly one of the leaders in terms of redeeming the auction rate securities and finding alternative source of financing. So because they started getting out of auction rates earlier, mm -hmm. their earnings were negatively impacted much earlier than, say, BlackRock, who started redeeming the auction rate securities later in the year. And then one of the points that we sort of did uh, touch upon in the muni space, you also have to be aware of reinvestment risk. Like Michael said, right. the bonds that are coming due, because the muni yields are at record low, how do you go back and reinvest these monies to kind of match the average coupon of some of these funds, which obviously are much older funds, and they may be earning 5% on average, but right now you can't go in and invest at 5% when your bonds come due in a certain portfolio. So I think that had to do with also some of the dividend cuts that we've seen. Do you use the concept of uni outside of municipals? It seems like we keep hitting home on municipals with uni balance. Do we, should it be used outside the, the parameters of municipals? Um, yeah, I think it's used a lot less. Um, you'll see some taxable funds have some level of uni, uni balance, but you also see a lot of taxable funds have level distribution policies uh, where the distribution, and I say distribution, not dividend, because some comes from net investment income, some from short-term capital gains, some from long-term capital gains, depending if they have exemptive relief, um, and return capital. So uh, you see a lot less on um, the taxable side than the muni side. You also have to remember an uni balance is, is a balance sheet item. Um, it's theoretical. Um, it's, it, it's actually, the assets are actually invested in, mm -hmm. in, on the new side in bonds. It's not some little pot at the end of the rainbow. Um, it's working for you, um, <laughs> but it's not it's just this little uh, pot over here with a, a few dimes. It's actually invested, right. so it's, um, it's just an accounting term. And if I may just also add, your uni balance is part of your net asset value. Yes. Right? It's, it's not a separate pot away from your net asset value because it is a balance sheet item. So when you see if amount is taken out of uni, obviously it's coming out of your net asset value as well. Right. Like any dividends come out of net asset right. value. Right. Uh, we had a question come in over the web. Uh, can you talk about improvements in liquidity constraints within the closed end fund space? Have we seen improvements? Are, are, are things much more liquid now? I know we've seen some corporate actions recently, people announcing mergers or open ending for smaller funds. Do you feel that liquidity is better now? I'll take that. I mean, I mean, Maybe marginally it's improved over the years, but it's, these funds are still not liquid. Um, so I would kind of go out and say we have not seen big improvements. Um, maybe because you know over the past four or five years, some bigger funds uh, you know were launched, you know billion dollar plus size funds. So those funds tend to have okay liquidity, but for the most part, uh, liquidity is still a major issue within the closed end space. Michael, would you, would you say liquidity? They're, they're liquid until they're not liquid. Exactly. It's, it never seems to be a problem when you're going in. It's when you want to get out and everyone else is looking to get out. So in that sense, what do you, what do you tell a client? I mean, do you, do you have people put in big blocks in certain names, or are you telling them, buy a portfolio, buy 10 or 15 different ones? I mean, what do you tell a client who's interested in putting money to work in the closing club space? I, I think you tell them to be diversified, but you also don't want to be overly diversified. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, like Michael said, it, they're liquid and then you can't get out. So when the market is up, that's the time to be taking profits, not when you begin to see weakness in the market, because that's really the clear test of liquidity when the markets are negative and you really can't get out um, fast enough in these funds. So don't wait for weakness in the market to take your profits or take sell your funds. Do it on an update. What, what we say is that uh, closed-end funds should be used part of an overall allocation for Perhaps if you have an allocation to munis um, and you have a ladder portfolio, perhaps you take out your longest ladder um, and fill that ladder with 10 or 15 percent of five or six different funds, depending on the size of, of your allocation. Um, and what you're doing is you're enhancing your overall yield of your portfolio. And if you want to get out, you're uh, limiting your downside because um, if you have in five different funds, 10 or 15 percent of your allocation, it'll be a lot easier to get out and. It'll, it'll a lot less harmful to your overall portfolio. And the other point to that, I mean, yeah, you should diversify for liquidity purposes, 
but diversifying among different asset classes. I mean, sometimes it works, but a lot of times when things hit the fan, all the stuff is very highly correlated because they're primarily yield vehicles. So you may go out and think you're getting diversification in non-correlated assets, but in reality, you're really not. So you, you, you want to be careful. Yes, diversify for liquidity purposes, but be a little tr careful when you're diversifying based on the underlying asset class. Now, Michael, you hit on something that I'm going to ask Alex. Are clothes, should people only view closed-end funds as a yield vehicle? Is, is, uh, have clothes, has the industry painted itself into a corner? Uh, in a word, yes. Um, th th they have painted themselves a bit into a corner. Um, one of the things that we said, you know, we have these the sort of stock snippets of text that we use when we're trying to convey an idea. Uh, sometimes we talk to closed-end fund investors who are very interested in the idea of buying assets at a discount, and they really are looking for something that's a deep value, what have you, and of course everybody is interested in yield. And what I always tell them is, if you're shopping on the basis of discount, if you're shopping on the basis of yield, you can put yourself in the wrong direction. Uh, for example, if you walked into a discount store that was selling any other kind of product inexpensively, you would know what you came in there to get. Uh, if you walked into a store and you were looking for whatever, something for your house, and all they had were cheap pink flamingos for the front yard, you wouldn't necessarily buy them even if they were very, very much on sale because it's not what you came to get in the first place. And so. I think it, it maybe even refers a little bit back to that first question that we had. How much do we pay attention to NAVs? How much do we pay attention to discounts? The idea of discount and yield, these are very important factors in terms of how they jive with somebody's asset allocation strategy. But that asset allocation strategy is the core part of portfolio, of building a portfolio for an investor. And I think investors should always have an eye on what assets do they want to own, and once they've made those decisions, then decide what vehicle do they want to own them through. And oftentimes, that'll be a closed-end fund. Sometimes that'll be a mutual fund but or exchange-traded fund or go out and buy individual securities themselves. But this idea of sort of shopping blindly on the basis of discount or on the basis of yield is a very, very dangerous one. Anyone else? Um, just one other point in terms of to Michael's point, these are leveraged instruments. So if you're if you're filling a, a, uh, using a fund to fill a particular uh, asset class, you have to remember these these are going to probably do better or worse than that particular asset class. That's why when I was talking about the ladder portfolio of munis, you take out your longest ladder, long duration, and you, you fill it mm -hmm. um, with a, a bunch of different funds because they already are our long duration funds, um, and they can they're rather volatile. Now, John, I'm glad you brought that up because we just had a question come in and just talks about when evaluating a manager, how important how important is the active management of leverage within the portfolio? So the, the, this uh, web question says some managers max out the leverage and never reduce versus other managers who are tactfully, uh, tactfully uh, reduced when prudent. So they're moving their leverage around based on where the markets go. How important is that when you're looking at a manager on the research side? I mean, I... Do you see it often? I think you'll, you see more in some taxable funds where we, we, you see some funds bring it up and down. It's, it's a lot, it's a less of an occurrence on the, on the muni side, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Sure, it, it, it's, um, it's a great idea. Um, it's not always practical because why do people buy these funds? They buy them for income. If you're constantly bringing up and down your leverage, um, well, up is not necessarily a problem, but when you bring it down and they're expecting a certain yield, and then the dividend gets cut and then your price goes down, it could exacerbate a certain situation. Um, I do see it more on the taxable side. Um, it's whether we would like it or not on the muni side, it just doesn't occur all that often. So that's fine on munis, but we've seen this change in leverage that you talked about earlier, sort of the changing of the capital structure. In essence, the, the ability to do so is much more in the hands of the manager now than it was four years ago. Yes. Are we seeing them utilize that ability, or are they just basically sticking to what as if it was still auction rate preferred outstanding. I'm actually, I, I'll, I'll, not to hide it, but um, I have seen it done on as many funds I cover on the taxable side. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it is being used. I think also key to remember, auction rate preferred leverage was a lot more transparent right. than these other forms of leverage are. And we clearly don't get information on a daily, monthly basis. Some fund companies do provide their leverage numbers uh, on a monthly basis, so it is a lot more transparent. But if, if a fund company is giving out information three, uh, every quarter, then you obviously don't know what happened during that quarter. Also, depending on type of leverage, you and I know we've had issues where what is to be treated as leverage right. 
Um, so that could all make things much more difficult for us to know what exactly the exact leverage is. And then it goes back to your relationship with the fund manager where you do have comfort in what they're doing and you talk, have a regular dialogue with them. I think that's where we add value as, as analysts. And Michael, is it safe to say that leverage has worked and it's been a one-way market since we've had this whole shakeup from coming out of 2008 and so that's maybe why managers aren't reducing their leverage? I think that's fair. I mean, leverage right now is great. I mean, borrowing costs are very cheap, you know, for the most part. Um, you know, and, and, and most assets have really come out strongly, you know, out of, out of second half of 2008, early 2009. So, um, you know, leverage has been a good thing, but at some point, obviously, that will change, you know, once rates start to head up on the short end, um, you know, or, or asset classes really, you know, sell off hard, you know, the, the leverage will exasperate that move. Well, one other, one other point, um, when funds uh, historically have used auction rate preferreds, Auction rate preferreds are underwritten offerings that actually cost the fund uh, money, to, you know, like about 1%, to, to come to market. Um, so you didn't see auction rate preferred going up, the, the level going up and down. Some funds actually had auction rate preferreds in a debt facility where the debt facility they could uh, manage the leverage. But if a fund just had auction rate preferreds, they weren't bringing it down because it was too difficult to bring back on and too costly. With these other forms of leverage, and I'm referring to the taxable, taxable funds at this point. Um, you know, many use credit lines and debt facilities, which can be brought up and down, although we don't necessarily know on a daily basis, as Cindy mentioned. Okay. No, we, we had, uh, Alex, a question come in before the call, uh, which is, I think, was a little new to us. Uh, and it talks about uh, some of the older closed-end funds that may have outstanding pension liabilities. Uh, what should an investor be concerned about these these older funds, we're talking funds that came back in the 1920s and 30s and 40s. Should they be concerned about those funds that have outstanding pension liabilities? Well, in a word, yes. I, I don't know if it has to be uh, something that overrides whether a fund, you know, a fund has a pension liability. It's not necessarily a deal breaker for the fund uh, or for a shareholder to want to own it. Uh, but that being said, as an investor investigating the liabilities that your fund has, uh, clearly well within the bounds of, of what you ought to be doing when you decide to invest. And what I think also is that it, it really highlights in an important way is that when you buy a closed-end fund, you are buying the share of an investment company. Um, so oftentimes, like these discussions that we've been having about yield and discount and bonds, whether they're callable and new issues of bonds and things like that, we often talk in the language of fixed income. But it's important to remember that we're actually talking about the equity shares of investment companies and these investment companies can have liabilities like, like pension obligations and the like that are important to keep track of. Okay. I think also important to kind of uh, clarify the point that we haven't seen this in the last few years, the new funds that come to market. We haven't seen these pension obligations. That's why I think a bunch of us were surprised that any fund would actually have pension liabilities. So when you're buying the new funds, especially things that have come out in the last five or eight years, um, I can't come up with one example where you would have pension liabilities related to a specific fund. Yeah, I think these were referred more to a lot of those older funds from, you know, yeah, equity, years equity, equity funds. Are yeah, they? from, from yeah. sort of the, the, the previous generation of funds. Another question that came in uh, through Michael, and I'm going to ask this of you, uh, many equity and equity covered call closed-end funds tend to monetize potential capital gains through utilization of a managed or a level rate distribution policy. Uh, given, the current, given the current capital market assumptions, at what NAV distribution rate do you start to feel uncomfortable? Sure, sure. And it, I mean, it, you really have to do it on a fund-by-fund fund basis. The way, we, the way we analyze it with the cover call funds is we look at where the net asset value of a particular fund is at. We look at how much of the portfolio is being written on, and then we also look at where levels of volatility are at. Now, this is very, you know, ballpark estimate. Um, you know, because obviously volatility can change day to day, but we try to get a good feel and say, you know, based on what the fund's doing, you know, all of those three factors I just mentioned, can they earn that distribution, you know, that they're paying out, you know, can, can they earn it from the call writing? And if we feel that they can't, right, then we, you know, we'll, we'll put in print that we feel you know, they have to cut the distribution or they're going to pay you bad return of capital, right? If we feel that they can earn it, right, based on where all, you know, levels of volatility at, are at, where the asset levels are at, 
um, you know, as, as well as sort of what's going on in the underlying asset class. You know, if we feel that they can maintain it, um, you know, we'll put that as well. So really, you have to look at it on a fund-by-fund -fund basis. Um, I mean, you may see certain, you know, certain funds that have yields that look like outliers, but maybe because they're writing single stock options, right? And they can get more option name, you know, premiums from it. So it really depends on the fund you're looking at. I, I would also just add, add one more thing. Um, we take great pains to remind investors that are investing in covered call funds that they are buying something that fits within the equity allocation of their allocation plan. And when you look at an equity fund, you're looking at a total return vehicle. You're looking at share price performance plus your distributions over the period of time to figure out what your rate of return is. And so one thing that I would say, oftentimes when people are concerned about a, a covered call fund earning its dividend or, or whether it's going to make a piece of capital gains that's sufficient to keep up with the distribution promise it's made, um, if they're not keeping up with that, you do get a return of capital. Um, that return of capital bothers me personally much less when somebody owns a fund at an enormous discount. If you own a fund at $10 a share that has $20 of assets, and again, I'm drawing an extreme example, um, I wouldn't mind if they liquidated $20 of capital the very next moment. Um, so a return of capital when you're at a very large discount is less onerous, obviously, than if you own a fund that's trading at a premium. And so all of these different factors interact with one another. Each individual fund circumstance is its own thing. And it's important then to look at them individually and what are the individual things that are going on inside a fund. Okay. So you don't, there's no sort of, hey, we're looking at this percent of return based on a the strategic Just one thing to clarify, John alluded to before that if a fund cuts its distribution substantially, that can have a very negative effect on the share price of the fund. Right. And that's something you definitely want to look out for. Uh, but if a fund is trading at an, in, an enormous discount, if we're talking about the, the 13, 14, 15 percent range, where we're, we're really talking big here, um, and a fund cuts its dividend from 10 percent to 8 percent, and again, I'm drawing a hypothetical. Right. Um, the impact on share price performance relative to the asset value is not likely to be huge. Uh, that's something that would concern me much less than if I saw a fund that was paying out a 10% rate and I thought it was going to have a 20% dividend cut, and that fund was trading at a 10 15% premium at the beginning of it. Uh, I would assume that the share price impact would be much, much larger. And so from a total return perspective, vis-a-vis -vis the NAV, the dividend cut on an equity fund is not likely to have very much return impact. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the share price, it can be a very different thing. And that has a lot to do with where that share price starts relative to its assets. Okay. So we look at each individual fund individually. Uh, the next question that came in from a listener is, can you comment on MLP closed-end funds? That's sort of been a hot-button topic uh, within the space. We've seen a lot of issuance in that space. We've seen funds uh, recently, a fund did an overnight, raised a couple hundred million in an overnight in the MLP space. Would anybody like to tackle or where you come out on MLP close then folks? I don't I don't cover them, so I don't I, I cover some. I mean we you know at MSSB we have a positive long term outlook um, on the MLP close end funds. Um, you know you really need to look at the space. You know there are only I mean funds do have different strategies, but I think one thing you know I always point out is there are only so many MLPs out there. I mean they're probably like seventy five investable MLP names. So, you know, yeah, portfolios differ, but they may not differ as much as you think. Um, you know, this is a particular area where funds at times do trade at premiums. Um, you know, so it, it's not, you know, I'm not afraid of, of buying a MLP close-end fund at a premium. There, you know, are a number of reasons why they do trade at premiums. Um, you know, but you want to look at them, you know, relative to each other. And, I mean, geez, would I pay a 10 plus percent premium for one of these funds? Probably not, but uh, nonetheless, you know, could, can I envision paying a three, four, five percent premium um, for an MLP closed-end fund? Sure. Let me ask you this: Do you prefer the MLP operating company structure, or do you prefer the MLP closed-end fund where it has to limit itself to twenty-five percent in MLPs? I mean, it depends what you want, right? I mean, if if, if you want, uh, you know, if you want all MLPs, you know, it has to be structured as a C corporation. Right? If you're willing to take, you know, royalty trusts or other energy companies, you know, then you can fit, you know, fit it into a RIC. So it, it depends on what you're looking for. Okay. 
Um, I mean, one thing I always tell uh, investors, because we cover exchange traded funds and exchange traded notes, the most efficient way to get MLP exposure is to buy the individual names. Okay, I'm mean, granted you have to deal with K1s and things like UBTI, but buying the individual names is the most efficient way to get MLP exposure. Okay. Now, last question because we're running out of time. We we're at our hour level, and I'm going to go around the table. Uh, if you were today to say where you see opportunity in the closed end fund space in 2012, where would you focus your efforts right now? I'll take it first. Um, I think you look at investment grade debt, high yield funds, um, even though some of you have to be careful again because they are trading at record high premium levels. Uh, but based on what we are positive on um, in, from UBS Wealth Management Research, fixed income is the area that we would focus on. Munis always long term selectively definitely belong in um, in a portfolio of closed-end funds, especially because we are um, in the midst of what happens to tax rates, etc. And if you live in states with higher income tax rates, like New York, California, then clearly muni funds also do belong in a portfolio. Yeah. I mean, I think you're, we're in a difficult, difficult situation because um, valuations are pretty high across the board, be it muni funds, preferred, senior loans, or, or whatnot. Um, one area I have been talking about, um, and, and certainly the total return prospects are less today than they were two months ago, even one month ago, or even one week ago, uh, would be some of the senior loan funds. Um, it's a category that I like, not for the historical reason that they've been used as a hedge against rising rates, but the fact is that the fund, some of the funds are still trading at small discounts at this point, a lot bigger a couple months ago. The average yield is about 6%, slightly higher. So your total, ret it, total return prospects of the underlying companies continue to, to improve, the, the fundamentals will continue to improve, and corporate balance sheets uh, have a lot of cash and are generally strong, um, so we think the underlying entities could rise a little bit, although they've rised a lot already. Um, so some of the senior loan funds, um, but the valuations are, are pretty high across the board. So it's tough. So would, in, in maybe a, a different, a second caveat, would you tell people to be more active in their exposure versus passive, like historically closed and funded investors have been much more passive. They buy a closed-end fund and they sort of sock it away. So, Alex, when you talk to somebody about 2012, what you like, where you're going, are you telling people to be much more active with their exposure and selling when valuations get too hot? Uh, in, in a word, yes. And, and this goes back to what, we were, what I was saying before. Uh, one of the components that you have to look at when you're analyzing or when you're thinking about owning closed-end funds is that you may have bought a senior loan fund, you may have bought a muni fund, you may have bought something that we think of as being part of our fixed income allocation, but you are buying a stock, you're buying a share of an investment company, and like any other company you would look at, uh, you have to have certain metrics in mind for what buying low and selling high means. And if you start to trigger some of those red lines that you're drawing for yourself, if you say, I bought this fund uh, because I believe that the net asset value can can perform well. So in the case of, let's say, the senior loans, uh, from last year, mid-year to this point, the senior loan indexes have done extraordinarily well. Prices have recovered not all the way, but they're a, a good ways back. Um, if you think to yourself that the underlying senior loan market should be trading at 100 cents on the dollar, uh, and then that happens, if you're thinking to yourself that the closed-end funds that represent this or that invest in this asset class should be trading at their historical norms of two or three percent discounts, whatever your formula is, when you start hitting some of those red lines, you should think about it in the same way that you would think about a stock that you own that has reached a full valuation in your opinion, and absolutely lighten up if that's what it calls for. So what do you like? Uh, well, I would echo John. I think that the senior loans are a nice way to get involved. They do a few things for you. Um, first of all, a lot of investors over the course of the past year, the strongest parts of their portfolio are the most interest rate sensitive parts. Their treasuries, their munis, their investment grade corporates, I mean, frankly, even utility stocks, things that have done well because interest rates have declined sharply um, have outperformed. Well, it also points then you know, on a broader asset allocation level to where your biggest weaknesses may be, and that could be when, when rates rise. Um, the old saying is you buy your straw hats in the winter, right? You buy what other people aren't shopping for. Um, the other thing about loans, which is nice, is that, like the name suggests, they are senior uh, in the capital structure of a firm. So even in the event of a default, if something really nasty happens, uh, loans typically recover in excess of 70 cents on the dollar uh, in a default situation. So if you have clients who are trying to dip their toe in the water, 
but wants some assurance that it's not going to get chewed off. Um, senior loans are a nice way to get some exposure to the economy. If the economy is improving, it might be lumpy, it might not be all in one fell swoop, but loans will give you a good yield while you wait, and they give you some kind of protection that's hard to find in the equity market. Michael, final word. Okay, sure. No, I mean, I, I am not, not a big outlier here, but uh, you know, right now we prefer select equity income names. Um, that being said, you know, you need halfway decent equity markets. Uh, if equity markets pull back significantly from here, the equity closed end funds are not the place to hide. But if we can get just halfway decent equity markets, I think certain equity income names can do pretty well this year. Okay. Thanks, Michael. I'd like to thank each of our guests, Andita Marfedi of UBS, John Mayer of uh, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Alex Rice of Steve Nicholas, and Michael Jabara of Morgan Stanley Smith Barney. I apologize to one listener who did send a question in after the fact we tried to close this up. Uh, we can try to reach out to them offline. But thank you, everyone, for uh, your time today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.